Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Preacher Boys podcast. Today, I am answering your questions with my friend, Michael McNeely, also known as the uh, sheriff of the Preacher Boys official discussion group. And we're going to be taking your questions from YouTube. I just picked a couple. If you have any questions you want answered on future videos, drop those right now, but let's dive right into it. On today's episode, um, I wanted to go through some questions that popped up over on YouTube. Like there's like, I was scrolling through, it was like overwhelming. I was scrolling through like comments and then you can filter like comments you haven't responded to. And there's like 6,000 comments and like 5,000 of those are all on one short about the Duggars. And I'm like, how many questions can there be about this topic? But I tried to pull some that aren't specifically about that. And I also added a question that right off the bat, we need to talk about is Travis Chapel related to Paul Chapel? So for those of you that are uh, following on social media, you've probably seen a couple of reels with me and Travis Chapel. So I'm Travis Chapel's producer of his show, uh, Travis Makes Friends. I've been working with him for like five or six years. And we did an interview together because he grew up at Lancaster Baptist Church. And that's what confuses a lot of people because his last name is Chapel. He grew up at Lancaster Baptist Church, which is run by Paul Chapel, but they have absolutely no relation. So um, I know some people, I guess, commented in the group and were like, when's he going to speak out? You know, when's he going to release his tell all about all this stuff? He's not related whatsoever. So I want to clear that up. And I know nobody's going to listen to this. They're going to watch another reel and still think the same thing, but um, I get it's confusing. No relation whatsoever. I'm going to start us off with a question that comes from YouTube. Um, and it is, in regards to a video I did with uh, Jeremy Coleman, who's a pastor on TikTok, who talks all about church abuse and church trauma, things like that. And one of the clips that I put out talked about this idea of not all churches. You know, like people always say, it's not my church. It's not every church. Like you're talking about this specific thing. And the essence of the video, essentially, and I'll clip it in here so people can watch it. I get so tired of hearing these folks justify it by saying, well, it's not all churches or, you know, it's not, you know, or my church is not that way. Or, you know, this was a, this was one circumstance. Like our church as a whole is not this way. And I'm like, you know, and, and I had somebody ask me, you know, well, when is it like going to be enough? Yeah. And I said, it's always going to take one more because, because the problem is, is is that so many people are not are, are so indoctrinated and so engulfed that it, they're never going to wake up out of it until it's them or their kid. That's when it's going to change and for even them. even then some don't snap out of exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And that's a that's a great point. That's a great point too. Essentially what he's saying is like if you're being silent and like if you're creating an environment where this stuff can happen, like you can't say not all churches. And it's super dismissive to say that sort of thing. And someone commented and basically, I think missed the point of the video, but said, I'm confused as to what you want churches to do. If it isn't their church, what can be done? And I do think this is a good question in terms of for the churches that are the quote unquote good churches, for the ones that don't have any abuse cases happening but they're seeing other churches that are similar to them just totally, you know, dropping the ball in this area. What should those churches be doing to be proactive in this area? I have my own thoughts, but I'll let you uh, run with it first. I do get this often from smaller churches, not necessarily the bigger churches, but I do get these, uh, this question from people who come from more rural church areas, because a lot of that isn't, something that they have to deal with. Um, and so the misunderstanding or the lack of understanding is, well, if it's not happening in my church, what is it that you want me to do about other people's churches? And to that, I would say my biggest thing is growing up in the IFB and knowing how small of a world it is and how a lot of those pastors want to be invited to conferences, uh, preaching conferences, missionary conferences. They want to be invited to the bigger churches uh, to either, you know, preach at a chapel to the college students or to go ahead and, um, you know, be invited to preach on a Sunday night to fill in the pulpit, whatever the case may be. 
a lot of those pastors like to go and, you know, makes them feel a lot better, um, you know, to get out and, and do that appreciated, um, you know, that sense of inclusion. And that's where I think I have my issue is when I see the pastors of these smaller churches who may not have these issues go preach in the pulpits of Jack Treber, Paul Chapel, you know, Fairhaven, Hiles, all of these institutions that have had the issues and are well documented and well proven um, and their stands have been very soft. And so that I would say, I would I know what the IFB mantra is when it comes to um, you know cutting off all of the worldly things and you know uh, disassociating yourself from anyone that doesn't agree with you, but yet you won't give that same courtesy to people that you know that in churches or are part of churches that have not taken a stand and have actually gone the other way and have tried to cover it up because they're you know afraid of what it can do so knowing how the intricacy of all of that works i know full well that your church does associate with churches the bigger churches that do do these things you know whether you're sending your kids to the youth conference there whether you're sending your kid to the missionary conference there whether your pastor is going you know the youth going i don't really care my question to you is why are you okay with just maybe visiting because that's that's the excuse i do get when i ask that question is oh well, we're just going for a youth conference it's benefiting our kids what do you want us to do there's nowhere else for us to go well shouldn't that tell us something um about the state that the ifb is in and so that's what i would say to those that you know th that'd be the first thing the second thing i would say is that it's kind of more on the silence front. Well, if it's not in my church, then I don't have to deal with this. I don't have to, you know, um, talk about this. And we have this fallback of not really turning a blind eye to it necessarily, but because it's not happening to me, therefore it's not really happening out there and I don't really have to worry about it. I don't have to be consistent in my stand against it. Um, and that's where I would say having a loud voice and disassociating yourself from these institutions and churches that do uh, are covering it up and are, you know, passing, you know, these pedophiles back and forth across the country, you know, uh, when they find these things out. That's where I would say is missing with a lot of people. And some of them is just out of plain ignorance. I don't think that they really know. Um, you know, and, and and I do want to put this disclaimer because I, I did get some feedback, some pushback, however we wanted to find out in the last episode we did, because I think people thought that we are out to get their church or mm -hmm. we are anti-independent fundamental Baptists or we're anti-church, anti-religion. That's not the case. Like I will stand next to anybody that wants to believe in their right to believe whatever it is that they want to believe and have the freedom to do so. I'm mm -hmm. not against religion and churches and institutions or, you know, anything along those lines. What yeah. I'm against is covering up the evil that goes into and not talking about or not allowing it to be talked about, um, you know, the evils that are going on and downplaying. Oh, you know, well, it's just, you know, it's just sexual abuse. It's, you know, kind of like this, you know, broken arm thing. You know, you got a broken arm, you, you know, you got sexual abuse. They're the same. You should just, you know, let it heal and get over it, get over it. And I think that that's been something that is lacking socially as well as in our churches uh, is the fact that we don't talk about the bad that comes with a lot of the good. And I don't think it's fair for a lot of people to say, well, look how much good they do. Well, this church is doing so much good. Well, when they cover up these heinous crimes and sins, I don't care how much good they do, because in a lot of people's eyes, they're not doing good. And that's the Bible. That's the New Testament. I mean, what did Jesus say about harming children? Okay. Yeah. But yet we 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 gloss over that portion of it to go straight to all of these other verses that you know we use to defend it. So I would definitely say, um, you know, disassociation knowing how it works. 
I think that that should be carried out to the churches that you do know and visit and attend to and pastors who will go to these churches uh, and, and preach and not take a stand against it or not ask questions or inquire, but will gladly take the love offering from that church or gladly mm-hmm. attend that youth conference or, you know, missions conference because it gives them a sense of, you know, uh, of community um, to which I say, why or where's the consistency? Right. So that would be my response to, to this, even though it's not in your, maybe in your individual church, it's in a lot of the churches in the circles that you run around in. And what are you going to do when it comes to that? Are you going to turn that blind eye and just go, eh, it's not in our church, so it's not my problem? Or are you going to, in fact, take that stand? Right. Yeah. No, I think that's, uh, you mentioned two things I think are good. One, I have noticed like there are the independent churches that are rural that really don't associate with anyone because they have nobody nearby at all. And like, and I want, I want to be clear too. Like, I don't think that every issue has to be your main issue. You know, like I don't think churches have to talk about this every Sunday. Um, But I do think like you said on, on the flip side, I think that it's not a bad thing to when something like this happens in a quote unquote sister church or a, you know, someone within your denomination to like take a second to address it and just reiterate your own stance on it. You know, that, that takes a few minutes to like say, Hey, we saw another story in the news and, and pastors do this all the time with a variety of topics where they'll see something in culture and like reiterate the church's stance on it. And I think if you did that with, abuse. I think that would be really helpful. I think the other thing too, as far as like, and you touched on this a bit is like, we just live in a period where there's no excuse to not know something. (laughs) Like I have people all the time that reach out to me that go, can you look into such and such a church? And, um, or I've had pastors that say, can you give me details about this story? And the reality is when someone asks me, I'm going to Google and going, such and such a church abuse or such and such a church this. And like, it's amazing how many churches I do that and stories start piling up and you start seeing articles and mugshots and police reports. And we have Google. There's really a lot of opportunity to access this kind of information. If you're a pastor specifically, and you're about to take your kids to youth, you know, a youth conference, it's your duty to Google every speaker. It's your duty to see, not just where do they stand on the King James Bible? It's like, where do they stand on abuse? And like, has their church been involved in cover-ups? Like who are they partnered with? And to your, to your point, you know, they separate over things like music and other issues, but when it comes to within the church, they're really afraid to draw those lines on this, on this topic. You would be surprised how many uh, former college students that are pastors, independent fundamental pastors out there, are still sending their kids to Fairhaven. And I'm going, you know the abuse. You either told me and others personally, or you've already said it publicly, that you're not okay with it. Right. Why am I seeing that your kids are going there? Like, that's the type of stuff that I just are. And it's like, but that question always comes back. Where do you want me to send them? Mm. Well, I don't know. Like, reconcile the the burden of proof is on you to reconcile that with me not me tell you where you should right. send them. Yeah. you know you have no problems homeschooling them for right. you know uh all of their years in elementary and high school because you didn't like the public school it, why can't you just do it not like you think that sending them to Fairhaven or sending them to uh West Coast Baptist or any of these other seminaries are going to uh, give them anything more than what you're giving them as a pastor and as a church. Uh, yeah. That's, that's where, that's where I kind of, they lose it with me is when they can't really give me an honest reason as to why there's this inconsistency other than yeah. where do you want, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to send them? Right. That's not a legitimate reason. Start your own thing, figure out your own conference, find other churches like that. Yeah. Like if I was if I was a member sitting in your pew, I'd be like, "What the heck? 
you, yeah. you two years ago you came out and you said you are not in agreement with this and now our kids are going to you know you're you're wanting my kid to go to their college yeah um that's that's where you know a lot where a lot of that kind of you know train derails with me uh yeah. trying to hear that those excuses but yeah it was so funny somebody commented the other day on um i should have queued it up in here because it was it was funny but they i had posted a video saying i spent seven days a week on the campus grew up in christian school all this stuff and undoubtedly there's always people in the comments when i share that stuff they're like that's great yeah that's good and uh, somebody commented and said you know i went to public school and christian school and christian school was a much better environment like that's undebatable and i just laughed and responded because i said you know you're talking to somebody who the vice principal resigned whose husband is a pedophile the new principal just got arrested last month or this month for being a pedophile i was like you're uh you're missing the the point here <laughs> it's it was just funny like your experience was great you're lucky that you were in such a safe secure environment another question someone asked was have you thought about doing a video or two about abuse at crown college in pal tennessee it's one of the places that many times gets overlooked when people are exposing corruption um for myself i'll just say i cover stories generally that either get reported on and there's like something I can point to that's an article or something that it's, you know, kind of breaks down what's happening and I can have enough to piece together a story. Um, but more likely than that is like, if somebody reaches out and says, Hey, this happened to me, like I'll work with them to get that story out with crown. I just haven't really had many people that have come out with a story. Um, and there hasn't been a ton of public stories that I'm aware of, but I guess my answer to this question would be, if you know some things, feel free to shoot me an email, preacherboysdoc, D-O-C, at gmail.com um, with any info you have. Um, I don't know, Michael, I mean, do you know any stories out of Crown that are worth covering that I have overlooked? I've not heard of any abuse stories. All of the stories that- I haven't either, yeah. Because um, Clarence Sexton used to come to Fairhaven uh, often for preaching conferences um early when i was younger yeah and then when he changed his supposedly changed his doctrine on um i think it was the church uh that's mm. when a lot of the ifb knives came out for him plus his church was growing by leaps and bounds it was getting more into like the mega church status yeah, they're pretty they're pretty big <laughs> and you got the jealousy portion um i've got a few friends that went there um they've raved about us said it's really good they really enjoyed their experience so i've not heard anything Personal, but if the law of statistics tells us anything, you know, it's something that large, uh, yeah, church, uh, you know, there's probably something that is there. Yeah, that's what's hard. Yeah, that's what's hard too. Is like, I mean, I've heard stories from like that are typical with the religious weirdness, you know, and obviously, I think during during the election cycle with Trump, there were some very funky political things, but like. As far as abuse, I haven't heard anything. My understanding, and I hope people don't take this wrong way, and I know people are going to probably debate whether this is true or not. I, 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 in my opinion, in my opinion, I think Crown College seems to be a lot like, you know, Lancaster Baptist Church. It's, I think, it's the same reason I don't cover Lancaster Baptist Church often, which is that they run a lot more like an organization in terms of they seem to deal with cases of abuse that are public or could do damage to the organization very quickly. Now, again, I don't want to even get into motivations for that. And like, is it just PR? Do they actually care? Cause I don't know. At the end of the day, I truly don't know. Um, I know that I've directly communicated with Lancaster Baptist church to um, check in on something that I heard that didn't seem to make sense from what I understood. And in that particular case, they did deal with it correctly. Um, and they did respond to me like they were cooperative in getting to the bottom of the story. Um, again, I have plenty of issues. There's episodes about it. Like, don't come attack me in the comments. Um, when it comes to Crown College, from what I've heard with similar stories is that they kind of take that same approach where it's like if something could affect 
the multi-million dollar business that is that organization, they address it. Um, you know, I think the reason that Hiles Anderson and Bob Jones get talked about so much is like, they're just so sloppy compared to some of the other, or, you know, same with golden state. Like they just don't run. I think Paul Chapel is a better CEO than a Jack Treber or a, you know, fill in the blank with a lot of these other guys. Um, again, whether, he, whether he's good or bad, I'll let people decide for themselves. Um, but that's kind of my impression, but I'm sure after releasing this, I'll get like 30 emails, like with crazy stories <laughs> from crown. Cause that's always what happens is they go, are you kidding me? And then they send me all this information, which please do. Um, I'm just saying that's my impression right now. That's in my opinion, disclaimer, disclaimer, don't shoot me. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think when it, when it comes to the IFB um, and knowing the history of the IFB, there seemed to be probably, I would say in the nineties, a crossroads where a lot of these IFB pastors who had started their own colleges had to decide is the college going to be a part of the church mm -hmm. or is the college going to be the business side of the church i guess is the best way to put it because you know you look at hiles and crown and i'm sure west coast in some of these colleges that just kind of blew up overnight where the church was rather large to begin with but yeah. then you know the college went from 100 to a thousand almost, you know, in, in a span of five years. And I think that some of the pastors were okay with it, like Sexton and Chapel and, you know, and then I think you got people like, you know, Fairhaven and, you know, um, Treber and a couple of these others who are like, hey, we still, the identity is still the church. The, mm -hmm. the priority is still the church. And if the college wants to incorporate into the church, then we're we, that's what that's what we're going to do and that's you know whether you want to call it a business model or you know whatever yeah sure you want to ascribe to it but then you got you know these bob jones type models where the church is there because of the college yeah and so you know i think that that's where a lot of this gets lost and like you're saying it's get run it gets run like a company it's because it basically is because I, and I've heard this from, you know, some of the people that are there yet the college and you had the church and they were almost two separate entities, mm -hmm. even though you'd be in the church choir, there's people that you would never run into and yeah. probably wouldn't even know because, you know, they may go to the first morning service or the second morning service right. or, you know, it's just so large and they keep the college separate college does all their stuff. And then you have, you know, the church school who's set, you know, so there's all yeah. these different things. So I, I understand. And it's kind of unique to see, you know, which ones because the ones that kind of went like you're saying more business and CEO, it's buttoned up. They take yeah. care of things. They don't want that bad. Which could, there. which could be worse. It could be the stuff you find out 20 years later, they really buttoned it up, you know, like, and yeah. you know, and there's, I mean, there are a couple of stories from Lancaster that I have very bad feelings about that, you know, I know someday the truth hopefully it will come out. It's just, it, it is a lot easier to report on. Like, I mean, Hiles was so sloppy. Like there's so much stuff that just is out there that you can just point to. And it's like, it's, I'm not saying it. That's what I guess I'll mm -hmm. say. It's hard to, it's hard when Jack Scop is the pedophile, the, the <laughs> lead of the church too. And he's that. slipping up all the time. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it, and that's the thing I'll say is my final disclaimer. And I was like, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm saying in some ways it could be more dangerous when someone really buttons things up. I'm just saying that's the case in my experience dealing with these guys is like certain schools just do a better job, better in terms of, I'm not saying morally better, better in terms of like as a organization going, we have an HR department or not. You know what I mean? Like that kind of stuff um, is different. Like when I reached out to Lancaster about a certain story that I had heard, um, you know, when I emailed to their general email within that same day, their HR department reached out to me and provided information like that to me is good in terms of function of how they run versus it being a secretary, just going, I'm not going to respond, <laughs> you know, and like going that route. So anyway, all that to say, 
This sounds a lot like bitterness, Michael. Why are we talking about the IFB? Why not talk about all church abuse? This was another question. This has come up a ton. Someone commented this today in a different form where they said, why are you only focused on the IFB? You don't care about abuse and you minimize abuse outside of it. And I said in a quick response, uh, Jan, this is something I talked about within Hollywood because I literally just a couple days ago was talking about Harvey Weinstein again. I've talked about this with Nexium. I've had Sarah Edmondson on the show and Anthony Nippy Ames on the show talking about it. I've talked about this in various different settings. My my answer to this one is my focus is on the IFB because that's my background. And it, you know, I think I was thinking about this today as I was heading over to the mechanic, which uh, was so much fun. Um, but I was thinking about it and and thinking about focus and focusing on the IFB specifically. And I think abuse does happen everywhere. Um, there, clip that. And so that way I can just share that with every pastor that brings this up. Abuse happens everywhere where there's certain amounts of people, abuse happens. Um, I don't think every church is responsible for when abuse happens at their church in terms of like guilt. Like if you have a pedophile in your church, you don't become you know complacent or, com- or complicit in that until you make the decision with what to do next. Um, if you contact authorities, if you go through the right steps, if you turn them in, you're doing the right thing. You just were a victim of you know, statistics like one in so many people is going to be a bad person. Um, now, so it happens in every group. I do think the IFB as a system, and when you look at the people who really formed it, they were abusive themselves. So they created a system that made it easier to get away with this kind of stuff. Um, but what I'll really say about the focus aspect of this is with abuse happening everywhere and with all of us having different human experiences that place us in different spheres where this stuff happens, whether that's, you know, I think of Allison Stoner, who's talking about being a child actor and all the abuses that happen there, or whether you're a Sarah Nippy that were raised atheist and join a personal self-development group called Nexium that became something very cultish and terrifying. Um, I think if all of us take the time to talk about the good and the horrifically bad or abusive in some cases in our own experience, if we all clean up our section of the world, I think the world has a net positive improvement. You know, like if I talk about the IFB and Leah Remini talks about Scientology and Allison Stoner talks about Hollywood and -and so-and-so talks about this, like we all focus on the areas that actually affect us and the people we care about. Like, there's not a negative impact from that. If anything, it's just helping the world as a whole because we're helping our segment of the population we can talk to. Um, I could do a podcast on the Catholic church, but I'm not a former Catholic. Like I'm stumbling around trying to figure out how to approach that. Like I could talk about Islam. I don't, I didn't grow up going to mosques and, and being raised in that religion. So like I'm going to focus on the IFB because that's what I know. That's what I can speak to. And I know that it's not talked about enough. So, you know, as long as there's lots of people willing to listen and I'm still willing to talk about it, I think that's something worth doing. Um, But that's, I mean, that's my approach. I don't think it's because the IFB is worse. I hate that whole conversation of like, is the IFB worse than the Catholic church? It's like, I don't, I mean, who cares? You know what I mean? Like it's, it's one way or another these are terrible, terrible things happening to innocent people. We need to talk about it. And then it's a conversation of what are you most equipped to tackle? Like for me, I think it's this for some, it might be the Catholic church. Um, that's my take on it. I'm curious what your thought is. Yeah. I mean, I think looking back where we're at now, looking back, you know, kind of where it was five, six, seven years ago when all this Mm -hmm. started, when I was put in contact with you, there was a void. Yeah. of people talking and exposing the IFB movement. Um, I mean, you could turn on the news and see the Catholic Church getting exposed by the media. Uh, you can turn on the news and see, you know, like you said, Leah Remini uh, expo- exposing Scientology. Um, you know, all of these different entities were being talked about. The, the, the biggest void at the time was, where do IFB people go? Because the abuse wasn't just sexual, it was physical in a lot of cases, emotional, uh, verbal, like 
we're dealing with a, a lot more of on the that side of the abuse than we were in most other denominations. So I would follow up exactly, you know, you hit the nail on the head when, you know, with what you said, but there was a void. Like who was talking about it before you did? Relatively nobody was getting swept under the rug. Now look where we're at. Now we're getting, no. you know, um, all of this information out there. And I think people do what they are going to do with it. Um, so I would say that 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 that's a void that needed to be filled yeah. uh, when you came in and did it. Uh, and I mean, to me, when people ask this question to me, I always say, are it's kind of like the question that we started off with, like, um, why are you deflecting? Mm -hmm. Why don't you want to look your own? I can't say denomination because they're going to all say we're independent, but you say denomination. Yeah. <laughs> and so why don't you look at your denomination and clean your house and stop yeah. worrying about everybody else's house that is dirty? Because if, like you said, if everybody cleans their own house, all these houses get clean and we're going to, you know, put, you know, the safety of our children as a high priority, the safety of our, you know, daughters and wives and, you know, everyone in the church is going to feel safe. Um, but until then, there's going to yeah. be predators because the IFB, I will say this, the IFB uh, created because they created an environment that allowed pedophiles to excel and do what they want. Because mm -hmm. those pedophiles knew full well they weren't going to get reported to the police. No. There's not going to be much accountability. The accountability is going to be the pastor of the church. And if you're a bigger donor or, you know, um, good friends with the pastor, he's either just going to ship you off. Or if you're on staff, they're going to ship you off to another church in another state. So what, 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 where was the accountability? Eric is trying to hold people accountable and you guys and people are asking well and pointing the finger to other denominations no that's deflection no that's deflection because we don't want to talk about the bad and the, i'm going to say this too i know we try not to get into the social aspect of things but we can see this bleed over into the social aspect we don't want to talk about some of the things that come with you know capitalism the bad of it we don't want to talk about the bad of, you know, the, the the racial component in our country. We don't want to talk about some of these things that need to be talked about that over through COVID were at the forefront. We were all captive audiences to a lot of these issues, but yet we want to sweep it under the rug as best we can because we don't want to talk about it. Je that was our grandfather's generation. That was our father's generation mm -hmm. that just didn't talk about, well, why did aunt, you know, so-and-so have to get married so quickly? Well, she got, you know, we don't talk about that. Nobody brings it up. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, you know, we should be the generation, the generations behind us should be the ones. No, let's talk about this. What are the pros and what are the cons? What is the good? What is the evil right. of, of what we're trying to decide here? And whenever I hear questions like that, it's like, yeah, you're just deflecting. You don't want to take responsibility and hold people accountable because that means you have to do some inward, uh, you know, uh, soul searching and yeah. a lot of people don't want to do it they are comfortable with where they're at they don't want to step outside of that comfort zone and because they're going to get arrows yeah i mean look at the viciousness that, that you've had i've had you know the 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 uh, abused have come forward that the victims that have come forward have had like it's not nice it's not fun but guess what that's what's going to happen until we clean house and and yeah. and you know, shine a light on all of this that's going on. So that's what I would say to someone who wants to point to other denominations, like, let's clean our own house. Let's, yeah. let's get this spotless. And then we can probably shift focus to what other denominations are doing. Right, right. Yeah, I, I want to mention two things. Um, one, I, I do want to give a shout to, like, Sarah Smith with her article um, that really... I mean, she documented like, I think 300 different churches, um, 
you know, and stuff on these like was kind of the early pioneer that was like, I want to give a shout to some of the OGs out there that were like talking about this stuff. Um, you know, uh, but I do think I, I agree. There was a void in terms of, now I've talked about this a lot, like stuff on these like kind of winded down and closed out the site, um, you know, with reporters that have covered it incredibly, you know, the resources just aren't there and the audience isn't really there locally for a local paper to carry on with these stories. And so I think the void was like, how do you consistently talk about this weekly? And I think you just have to be someone who's been in it. Like you can't expect that from, I think any publication that's not run by a madman that's lived in it, (laughs) you know, like it has to come from that kind of place. It's kind of, it's kind of like the national media. Mm-hmm. The national media is not going to cover a story in a town in Timbuktu. Right, they're right. Going to. They're going to take all of the very surface level issues that are impacting nationally. Water them down to where you can there. understand it. And yeah. Yeah. Right. But, but, but a lot of the local stuff gets, you know, left out. Right. And so that's where I would say, like, with this, sure, there were a lot of people talking about the Catholic Church and, you know, all these other denominations. Nobody was talking about the IFB movement and the evangelicals. Like nobody was yeah. really shining a light and exposing what was going on um, and the cover-ups that were going on. I mean, I remember when I reached out to you, I was like, where do I go? Where, how, how, do we, how do we stop this? Where, you know, right. with, with my sis- sister story and others that I knew, like, what are we going to do about this? Because yeah. um, nobody, nobody really cared on the national level. There's not going to yeah. be papers there you know, are going to carry it unless it's a Jack Scott type of a thing. Right. Where it's easy in the Chicago, you know, you know, WGN for a five minute segment and then it's gone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, definitely necessary. I think it's important to be able to have these kind of longer conversations. Um, and I, 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 I do have one last thing on that one before, uh, I forget it. Um, my question to people who do, my question in return to that is why does this make you so uneasy to talk about our denomination or our former denomination? What, what makes this so uncomfortable that we can't have these conversations without deflection, deflection. We'll look over there. They're doing this. They're doing that. Like we have to come to a point where we can have difficult conversations without getting upset getting angry um lashing out deflecting like all of these things because i'm telling you now the more information that are at the young the generations at the fingertips of the generations coming up behind us they're going to question a lot more than what we're questioning and they're going to want to know why we didn't talk about this why we didn't discuss this why we're you know, uh, not shining a light on this. And we're going to have to answer our kids and grandkids as to, you know, what happened and why we weren't keeping people safe and shining a light on this. And so my question is always, why does that make you feel so uneasy? Why do we have to deflect and point to other denominations or say, hey, it's not happening in my church. Therefore, it's, you know, I don't washing my hands clean of it. I don't have to deal with it. And by the way, why are you even talking about it? We're talking about it because it's an issue. It's a problem, systemic problem. That's why we're talking about it. Right. Why don't you ask the people who are covering up why they are doing what they're doing? Why does that question come to us? Right. Right. Why does it make you feel so uneasy? Yeah. I just that's what I don't understand. Yeah. It's, it's, why are there stories, you know, like, and that's the thing I remember talking to you a couple months ago and going like, I felt like I would be done (laughs) by now where it's like, and it is, it's crazy. Like the last several weeks at the end of the week, I just literally go through a list of the stories from that week. And it's like, why are there four or five or six stories this week? from such a small group of churches, you know, like it's, it's just really, it's really frustrating, but yeah, I mean, to kind of, well, but, but you, you, you put it per capita, it changes, it changes. the. I the, know. The, like, you can point to, you can point to the Catholic church all you want and rightfully so justly so, 
but how many Catholics are there in this world and, you know, priests and all that compared to the IFB? Yeah. If you it's, go per capita, person to person, the the higher percentage of pedophiles are in the independent fundamental Baptist evangelical churches. Yeah, I, I remember we did this like in 2020, but yeah, what we were looking at, I want to redo the math and maybe have somebody because I, I think someone could present this in a very interesting way. Um, but yeah, I remember taking the percent, it was like the amount, I think we just took the amount of Catholic, I forget how we did it, but yeah, we basically found out like percentage wise, it was a higher amount. Again, I don't even, it's not, like I said, regardless, it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things because ultimately like one is bad. <laughs> like we've got things to talk about, but like, I think it's so the reason that I ever do bring it up is just because I remember pastors in the pulpit screaming and ranting about, you know, pedophile priests in the Catholic church. Mm-hmm. And it's like, if you're even in competition with them, <laughs> like at that point, it's a, to use a biblical phrase, it's like the beam in your own eye versus the, mm-hmm. I mean, the, granted the beam that's also in their eye, you know, it's not really a splinter in this particular example. Um, but yeah, I think at the end of the day, you know, from the first question that we took to the last is like, I guess what I'm tired of most is people kind of trying to focus on how they can get out of having any responsibility and learning, like, how can you take responsibility? Not because you're guilty of this necessarily, but if you've invited people to your church where something has happened, if you've done like, like how can you be proactive in helping take care of this issue? And for some that might be a podcast for some that might just be literally, you know, being a sounding board for survivors for some, like, I'm not saying it has to be a massive swing. Um, but I think for churches specifically, it's like if the amount of energy was spent, that was spent deflecting was spent on reflection <laughs> on themselves. Like that could really lead to some major, major changes, but it could, I'm it, curious, could be, oh. it could be as simple as sitting down with your, you know, pastoral leadership at your church and saying, what's the protocol? What's the, yes, policy? just asking what yeah. regards do we have put in place for our church? Mm-hmm. It could just be as simple as that. And it finding out, well, we really, you know, we've really never thought about it or, you know, we don't really have anything put. Okay. What are we going to do? Because guess what? It's your sons Mm -hmm. and daughters, right? That this is going to happen to, um, and if procedures, policies, and things aren't put in place, you're going to be, you're not being proactive. It's going to be, something's going to happen. And then that's going to cause a lot of hurt, a lot of pain in that church and in that community. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm curious for people who are listening, I covered a couple questions on this. I'm curious to know what other questions there are. I've got some really exciting things to talk about very soon, which I'm sure will bring along a lot of other questions. Um, But if you have any questions, be sure to drop them in the comments of this video. If you're listening to the podcast, head over to the Preacher Boys official discussion group. If you're really kind, Michael will let you in and uh, not boot you out of the group. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for jumping on. Yeah. Answer the questions. Please do that. And uh, Michael, thanks for jumping on. We'll have to do this again uh, really, really soon. For sure. Thanks for having me.